Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Jimrick. Um, I'm now at, at UC San Diego. I started a lab there about a year and a half ago. Um, so if anybody, by the way, is interested in studying, you know, short and repeat variation or any of the topics I'm talking about, come talk to me because we're always looking for good people. Um, so I'm excited to be at winter school. I've never been at winter school before. And um, I, I tried to make this a little bit interactive. So I know it's first thing in the morning, so I'm going to try and keep things simple, but, but I am going to make you talk to me. So be prepared for that. Um, our lab does... Randomly picking I will randomly pick things, <laughs> pick people. If no, one, if no one responds, then I will randomly pick on you. Okay, um, so our lab does a lot of work on short tandem repeat variation, um, or STRs as we call them. Um, these are pretty tricky regions of the genome to analyze, so they bring up a lot of fun problems for us to, to try and solve um, and to deal with most of the programs in the world that have only been built um, with SNPs in mind. So we're going to talk about repeats today. Um, we probably, mostly all of us know about genome-wide association studies, or GWAS. Um, these types of studies have been pretty successful in the last decade or so in identifying regions of the genome that are associated with different human conditions. Um, but most studies that we do like this focus on a specific type of variation known as SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so here's an example shown here, um, such as a, you know, a single base pair change from a C to a T. And we ask a question like, do cases for this condition um, have a higher frequency of you know, one allele versus the other? Uh, but that's just one window into the ways in which our genomes can vary. So I think it's helpful to, to motivate why we might want to look beyond SNPs to see different ways that genomes can vary. So I'm going to just go through a couple of different classes of genetic variation here, and I'm going to keep track in the bottom right corner um, how many de novo variants we might expect for each of these classes of mutation. Um, so we briefly introduced SNPs already. These are single base pair changes. Um, you get about 50 new SNPs per generation. Um, you can also have indels, or short insertions or deletions of one or more base pairs. Um, these are a little bit less variable in humans. You get about three new indel variants per generation. We can also have uh, larger structural variants or rearrangements or different copy numbers of bigger chunks of DNA, um, or even pieces of G DNA that jump from one place to another for retrotransposition events. Um, but the type of variation that we're going to focus on today is something called short tandem repeats, uh, which is the um, short repeated motifs, such as the CAG repeat shown here, repeated in tandem. Um, because these regions are so repetitive, um, DNA replication machinery often gets confused and loops back on itself, causing variations in the number of repeats. Um, so as a result, um, these locations in the genome can be extremely um, mutable and end up being highly polymorphic in human populations. We expect out about 100 new STR mutations uh, per individual. So more de novo events than you expect from the other types of variation here combined. Um, before we go on, I like to give our definition of what we're calling STRs. Um, everybody has kind of a different definition, but we're looking at things where the motif size is from one to six base pairs. So anything from homopolymers up to hexanucleotide repeats. Um, if you put them all together, they're about eight base pairs long in the reference genome. Um, we do allow for imperfections in the repeat sequence, so you can have you know, SNPs or, or indels within the repeat up to a certain threshold. Um, and using our definition, we get about a million and a half STRs in the, the human reference genome. Um, so we've, we've known for several decades that STRs are actually really important for a variety of Mendelian disorders. Um, and I've shown a couple of examples of these, these here. One that many people have heard of is, is um, Huntington's disease. In Huntington's disease, you have a CAG repeat in a coding region of a gene, HTT. Most people have about 20 copies of CAG, but in some cases, this expands to 40 or more copies, causing this devastating neurological disorder. Um, something that's really I thought fascinating about Huntington's disease, and, and it's actually true of many of these other disorders as well, is that um, this repeat doesn't act as a switch, you know, controlling do you have this disease or, or do you not. There's actually more of a quantitative phenotype involved. So if you plot the number of CAG repeats versus the age of onset of disease, you'll see that the more repeats you have, the earlier you get Huntington's disease, 
Um, so really showing that this repeat is acting kind of a, as a dial, controlling how severe the phenotype is. Um, and this is, this is similar for a lot of these other disorders as well. Um, it often controls age of onset. Often longer repeats are also associated with uh, higher severity of the disorder. So we know about 30 or so cases like this, um, but I just told you on the previous slide that there's a million and a half of these types of repeats in our genome. Um, so that really got us thinking, you know, there's a lot of these in the genome. They can act in this kind of quantitative way. Um, well, what is the contribution of these STRs on a, on a, on a bigger scale um, contributing to more complex or polygenic traits in humans? And so this kind of drives a lot of the questions that we try to answer in the group. So what we'd really like to be able to do is to do association tests between um, STRs, between number of repeats, and some phenotype that we're interested in. Um, but there are some things that we need before we can do that. Um, we need tools to analyze STRs from the genome. And as we're going to see, they can be pretty complicated to analyze um, from things like next-gen sequencing data. Um, once we have those tools, we need to be able to apply them robustly to, to large cohorts of individuals. And then we can combine that with some phenotype information um, and finally do these association studies that, that we would like to be able to do. Um, so each of these three components is kind of a different section of the talk. Um, and each of them we're going to focus um, on some of the simple computational concepts driving them. And that's where the interaction is, is going to come in. I'm going to help make you guys help me find some of the solutions. Okay, first we need tools for genome-wide <laughs> STR analysis. Um, so STRs are, are routinely filtered from next-gen sequencing studies because they're, they're pretty tricky to look at. Um, and so before we talk about the specific tools, I wanted to mention some of the challenges that we deal with in analyzing these repeats. Um, so one challenge is that only reads entirely spanning an STR are completely informative of the number of repeat copies. Um, so if we have a sequencing read that looks like this, that expands only partially into the CAA repeat here, well, that can be compatible with four copies of the repeat, with five copies, or really any number of repeats greater than five. Question? But it told you it wasn't three, right? It told us it wasn't three. And this is like not entirely true that non-spanning reads are not informative. We're now actually building new tools that deal a lot with, say, properties of paired-end reads that, that can deal with reads that don't entirely span the STR. Um, but the tool I'm going to talk about here relies on reads that completely span across the STR. But that's exactly right. This does at least give us some bound on the number of repeats. If we want to know exactly how many repeats, though, we need reads that look like this, that entirely span the repeat plus some non-repetitive -flank, non flanking region on either end. Uh, another challenge is that um, large differences in number of repeats from the reference genome end up presenting as big indels from the reference genome. Uh, and actually, until recently, um, things like you know, this example shown here, where you have five additional copies of a trinucleotide repeat, so as a, as a 15 base pair indel, that might just get filtered by an aligner because it's, it's too far away. It's not close enough of a match to the reference genome. So it might either get thrown away or it might get misaligned to another region of the genome that has a similar repeat. Um, another issue is something we, called, we call PCR stutter noise. Um, so on the left, I'm showing um, a plot that this is the, the pre-sequencing method of genotyping SCR. It's called capillary electrophoresis. So it's basically you PCR amplify these regions and, um, and determine the size of the products that you get. And that, that tells you how many repeats were there. You get peaks corresponding to the size of the true alleles, but you also sometimes see these little blips that we call stutter peaks or stutter noise, um, corresponding to errors that usually happen during PCR amplification uh, before you actually did the experiment to measure, measure the size. So what does it look like when you look at, at sequencing reads? Um, well, this is an example of a group of reads that all came from the same underlying allele. Um, but because of this, this PCR-induced stutter noise, you get little errors in the number of alleles. So you might get little insertions or deletions um, to the actual allele that was present. Um, so something like six years ago now, we developed a method called Lobster um, that tried to overcome a lot of these steps. Um, basically, it, it takes in a FASTQ file with all your reads from your sequencing experiments. Uh, and outputs a VCF with your STR genotype at each of the million and a half or so repeats in our reference. 
Uh, I'm not going to go in detail through all the steps with Lobster, but I, I do just want to briefly describe how it works as some background. Um, so we have three steps. First, there's a sensing step where we quickly try and go through all the reads of the experiment and figure out which ones look repetitive um, using an entropy metric. Um, so we can quickly pull out the you know, 1% or 2% of reads in our data set that look like they contain an STR. Um, in the alignment step, um, we take only the non-repetitive flanking regions of those repetitive-looking reads and try and align those back to the reference genome, um, avoiding this issue of aligning across this entire repetitive region. Um, and then in the third step, the allelotyping step, we take all the reads that, that had repeats and align back to the reference genome. Um, and we, we model the, the PCR stutter noise, which we're going to talk uh, more in depth about, in order to determine the maximum likelihood genotype at each of these STRs. Um, so this is Lobster um, in about 2012. Um, since then, actually, other <laughs> tools have been developed that make this process a little bit easier. So since then, we now have BWA MEM that does a lot better job of um, at least picking up which reads map to these repeat regions. Um, it does a lot better job of picking up larger insertions or deletions from the reference genome. Um, allowing us to focus more on this, this third step of, of modeling the noise patterns that we get at these repeats. Um, and so just last year, uh, we have a new tool that came out called Hipster. Um, does a similar job to Lobster, but is able to um, focus a lot more on, on modeling and, and as a result um, is able to get a lot higher accuracy in terms of the STR genotypes. Okay, enter interactive mode. Um, so, we want to be able to determine the maximum likelihood genotype given all of the reads that we saw at a locus. And this is just one example of what we, what we might see at a locus that we're trying to genotype uh, in terms of, you know, here's some individual, here are all the reads with the number of, of repeats that we saw. Um, what, what do you think is the diploid genotype at this STR? Like, what would you guess if you had to guess? 7-7, seven, seven, homozygous for 7? Reasonable, right? Maybe six, seven, because we have like a couple of counts of six there, right? Maybe something else. Um, is there a better way to do this than stare at it? Probably. Um, so let's see if we can figure out a way to, to turn this into a likelihood problem and, and find the maximum likelihood genotype. Um, but first, a nice basic question for the morning. Which of these values gives likelihood? This is something that we talk about these things all the time, but I think it's good to make sure we actually know what they mean. Any takers? Second. The second one. Good. Okay. Likelihood is the probability of the data given some underlying model. Okay. These other things also all have names. So if we remember Bayes' rule, um, we can relate all these things together using this, where I used M and D because it was... I got too lazy to write model and data. Um, but here's our likelihood term. What do we call this guy on the left? What's this one called? OK, I heard posterior. Good. Um, and what about this one? What do we usually call that? I heard, I heard it sound louder. <laughs> Prior. OK, good. OK, so another question. For our genotyping problem, what is the model and what is the data? Yeah, right. So um, in, this, in this case, our model is going to be what's the underlying genotype? What are the parameters we're trying to learn? We're trying to learn what's the true genotype. Data is the reads that we observed, so we've already seen that. Okay, one more question here. Um, we're here, we're going to find the maximum likelihood genotype, but um, you might also consider finding the maximum posterior genotype. Um, why might you want to do one versus the other? <laughs> so what do we need if we want to find the maximum posterior? We need priors, right? What would our priors be? Population frequencies, something else? I don't know. I don't like dealing with priors, so we're going to find the likelihood. <laughs> okay, so we want to find um, the genotype that maximizes this likelihood. What's the probability of our reads given some genotype? Um, I already told you that, that this is what the data looks like. We have a vector of reads for each one we get a repeat count. 
Um, we want to know what's the underlying diploid repeat number at this locus. Okay, so we can try and write this down. What's the probability of these reads given the genotype? Well, we can hopefully assume that each read is basically independent. So if we can get a probability of an individual read, we can just multiply those all together to get our probability. Um, by the way, it's a lot easier, as we know, to deal with logs. So we can turn this into a sum rather than into a product problem. Um, in our case, we have two different alleles because humans are, are diploid and we, we like to deal with humans. Um, so we break this up assuming that each read is equally likely to come from either the allele, either of the alleles, which we denote as A and B here. So the key component that we re need to be able to model is, is this. What's the probability to observe a read with R repeats um, given that it, it was drawn from a true allele that had A repeats? Okay, so that's something that we can try and model from our data. So again, here's our, our group of reads. Um, Hipster has a stutter model that models two properties of stutter noise. So one is what's the probability to observe stutter in the first place? Um, and then the other is given that I actually observe a read that has a stutter error, what's the distribution of the size of that error? Um, again, that's something that we can write down. So Hipster tries to learn three different parameters of the stutter model. So there's what's the probability I see a, an insertion due to stutter? What's the probability I see a deletion due to stutter? Um, and then the step size distribution looks pretty geometric, so we can describe that by a single parameter P. Question? Does this really fix, this one really one fix value, or can you look at different, the different uh, repeat times or different? It varies by locus. Um, and I'm not going through this part, but we actually learn this per locus if we have enough samples using an EM algorithm. So we kind of iterate back and forth between estimating the gene type likelihoods and estimating the stutter model and kind of like keep doing that until that converges on something. <laughs> does it change a lot? Um, it does. So the main factors are the length of the motif. So things like homopolymers and dinucleotides have a lot of stutter, whereas longer things like hexanucleotides are pretty fixed. Um, and also the total length of the repeat has a big effect. So longer total repeats should have more opportunities to mutate. So the stutter noise is pretty linear with the total length of the repeat. Can you, oh, sorry. Another, uh, sorry, uh, he had a hand. I was wondering if it depends on genomic positions and how within the genome size Yeah, so the main factors, like I said, are length of the repeat yeah. and length of the total tract. Um, but there are other factors that seem to be correlated, like recombination or GC content, or even the <coughs> sequence of the motif. Um, but those are pretty minor effect compared to the length of the repeat itself. Can yeah. You do this jointly across individuals then? Yeah. So that's um, we used to do it, you know, using male sex chromosomes where we knew the answer and then um, trying to use that. But but now, given enough samples, say 50 samples, then we try and estimate this from the data itself at a given locus jointly across all the individuals. One more question, yeah? Seems like you should be able to like barcodes and genetic sequences, amplify them, and then do this without having to. People have done that um, using something called MIPS, that I don't exactly remember how it works. Um, but people have attempted to do that, and I think the parameters they get from that are pretty similar to what we estimate. I'll give some examples. And by the way, these parameters vary hugely based on if you're using PCR free versus with PCR data. Um, so for PCR-free data, this U and D, the, the probability of see stutter in the first place, is around 1 or 2 percent. Um, whereas if you have data that was not PCR-free, um, it can easily be 10 or 15 percent. So PCR-free lowers by an order of magnitude that error. Uh, one more. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, I was just wondering, too, is that if you could also uh, use nearby SNP to help you maybe... Um, you s sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you use nearby genotypes, like from, even from SNPs, to help you maybe to, 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 to see what things go together? Yeah, so Hipster actually, I'm not going through this part, but it does use SNPs nearby, um, mostly to get phase information, but, but that also makes estimating the noise easier because you know exactly which allele something came from and it's not this mixture of two alleles. So when present, we do use SNPs although I'm ignoring that for now because it gets a little bit more complicated, but not that much more complicated. Okay, one more. <laughs> yeah. The, the 
better was from PCR. Right. If you're a PCR free thing, why is there any stutter at all? I think there's still some amplification that goes on during like the bridge amplification part of Lumina. So there, you still have to copy the DNA. Right, you don't like do another step of PCR, but <laughs> it's like drastically reduced. Um, okay, so back to our example, which I, by the way, just made up these numbers, but this is, I didn't make up the results, but the vector of reads I made up. <laughs> um, using some uh, common values of these parameters that we get from data that is not PCR free. Um, these are the, the likelihoods that we get for our two top guesses for the genotypes. Um, turns out, actually, because deletions tend to be more common from PCR stutter than insertions, we end up saying that actually 7.9 is a maximum likelihood genotype at this locus. So not what we thought in the first place. In reality, with PCR-free data and higher coverage data, um, usually the answer is a lot more obvious than this. But, but you can see that sometimes it's not always so obvious. OK, so you know, to recap how Hipster does this, we, take, we start with a sample. We get reads containing all the numbers of repeats. We throw that into our stutter model um, to calculate the likelihood of each possible deployed genotype. And we return you know, both the specter of likelihoods, but also tell you what the maximum likelihood genotype was. By the way, if you work with VCF files and you're used to GL fields that have three different values in them, um, STRs can have like 20 or 30 different alleles, so your GL field now takes up the majority of the space in your VCF file. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, so that, that's the, the core of Hipster's genotyping method, but there are these other things that I'm not going to talk about, um, but just so you're aware that we also incorporate these other things in the model. Um, for instance, I mentioned physical phasing with SNPs. Um, and we can also pick up sequence differences between the alleles besides just length differences, uh, which is another component of that model. OK, so we've evaluated Hipster against um, other genotypers that you might use to call STR repeats with. Um, for that, we took um, genomes from the Simon Genome Diversity Project, where we also had capillary electrophoresis data. Um, and we, we used all these other callers um, in addition to Hipster to compare the true um, versus the, the, or the capillary genotypes versus those inferred by these tools. And here I'm plotting the sensitivity versus the accuracy um, because we, we didn't just take the calls as is from these different callers. We tried as hard as we could given all the information that they gave us to, um, to get the best calls possible. Um, and so still, after trying as hard as we could to tweak the parameters of these other callers, um, we see hipster nice up here at the top. Um, quite high accuracy and sensitivity um, compared to the other callers. GATK comes in a close second, and there's Lobster over here. He's pretty good. Um, but GATK takes a lot longer time to do this. Yeah? What's the difference between the dashed and solid lines here? Um, so I believe that the dashed lines we tried to, so the, the solid lines use the default parameters. And the dashed lines, we tried to tweak the parameters as best we could to do well at STRs, which not everything does out of the box. OK, so now we have a tool for looking at these repeats in genome-wide data. So let's try and apply it to um, some big cohorts of individuals. Um, I did want to make a case that STR calling has gotten a lot better. Um, when we first started doing this, calls were pretty awful, um, but since then callers have improved and, and technology, importantly, has improved. So just to give you a sense of that, um, here's our first effort to make an STR catalog in 1,000 genomes data back in 2014. Um, and we, to evaluate these calls, we compare it to capillary data, and we compare something we call the dosage, which is just for each genotype. We sum the number of repeats together, um, compare that sum between what we got and what was in the capillary calls. Um, so for 1,000 genomes data, um, they're highly correlated with the capillary calls, um, but the concordance is pretty awful at 41%. Um, thousand genomes data is actually, yeah. Capillary data, your gold standard, is it better than? It's the gold standard, so it's but standard. it itself has something like a 2% error rate if you compare replicates of the same individual, um, which is about as high as hipster's error rate is compared to capillary right now, so it's unclear if that's still the gold standard. That's something that we're working on doing is <coughs> getting experimental, to, making an experimental gold standard set of these repeats, which doesn't really 
exist besides these markers that everybody has genotyped for the Marshfield panel, um, and trying to, to get a better gold standard, because that's a good point. The gold standard might not always be right. Yes. Stay tuned to BioArchive, hopefully Friday. <laughs> yes, we're working on imputation. I'm not going to talk about imputation here, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. Um, but the answer is most of these can be imputed fairly well from SNPs. Um, OK, 1,000 genomes data was 4 to 6x coverage, um, a range of read lengths, most of which were not super long. Um, so the concordance was pretty bad. Um, but then fast forward a couple of years to 2016, we tried this again on the Simon's Genome Diversity Project data, um, which is much higher coverage. It's 30x, and it's also PCR-free. Um, we get up to 93% concordance. By the way, I didn't mention the size of the bubbles is related to the number of, of dots at that point, but they all overlap. Yeah. So how much is this driven by improving the methods and technology? Um, most of this improvement is, these are both using lobster. So um, that is driven by increased coverage and the PCR free. Probably coverage is the biggest thing for these because with 4X, you know, actually that's average genome wide coverage, but we need things that completely span STR. So you even like divide that by a factor of like three or four or five. So we usually only get one or two reads and thousand genomes data. Yeah. We do have negative numbers on the axis. Ah, so sorry about that. So everything here is, related is relative to the length in the reference genome. So if you're zero, zero, then you're the reference allele. If you're negative, you're a deletion from the reference allele. OK, so and then we take the same data set, the SCDP data set, um, now using hipster. And from lobster to hipster, we go up from 93% to 98.5%. So that answers the, the previous question. Um, is that by basically better modeling of these errors um, and a little bit of better filtering, which I'll talk about, um, we can you know, start to do quite well with these STRs. As I mentioned, the error rate of capillary is like 2%, so we're, um, it's unclear you know, what the true accuracy is there. Um, the most recent data set we've been profiling is um, a big data set from the Simon Simplex collection, which has 500 quad families. Um, this is actually the data set that we're using for the imputation, which I'm happy to talk more about offline, but here I want to talk about um, using it <laughs> to create a high quality catalog of STR genotypes, um, focusing on, on what we get in normal individuals or unaffected individuals. Um, so question, someone hands you a VCF file full of genotypes, um, what should you do first? What's the goal, Steve? The goal? Um, nothing yet. <laughs> Say you want to do some Goal X, learn biology is goal. Um, you open the final book then. Yeah, good, okay. <laughs> is this actually a VCF file or is it just like, I don't know, YouTube videos or something? Okay, what else should we do with like a brand new VCF file that someone hands us? Hand it to your grad student. Hand it to your grad student, good, okay. What should the grad student do? Yeah, we're going to get the Hardy Weinberg. Good one. OK, anything like even more basic than Hardy Weinberg? Quality controls. What kind of quality controls? Sensations, uh, transversions, ratios, uh, general statistics of like how many alleles, how many like this. Yeah, good. So the answer is that we should do some stuff before we start and do biology. <laughs> we should make sure that this looks reasonable. And I put this slide here because like too many times we've tried to go forward and do biology and then we go back and realize that like our VCF file is garbage and something went wrong in the calling and like half of the batches like got killed on Amazon and so we're missing like chromosomes 5 and 20 and like oh no. Um, so I just like put down a list of things that we like to do when we get a new VCF file full of genotypes before we start going and doing analysis. Um, and I think we talked about a lot of these. Hardy Weinberg was on there. I'm just putting a pause on Hardy Weinberg because I want to talk a little bit more in detail about that than just say Hardy Weinberg. But first I wanted to just mention, right now our, still our main source of error in the STR calling is something that we call heterozygote dropout. Um, so for hipster, I mentioned that we have this issue that we need to have reads that completely span across the repeat region. So if we have a short repeat of like 40 base pairs and we have 150 base pair Illumina reads, 
at the top situation, that's no problem. Um, but if you have a longer read or a longer allele that can either not be spanned or can barely be spanned by Illumina reads, um, often we're just not even going to see reads spanning that allele. Um, so that's a big issue if you have someone that is heterozygous for both a short and a long genotype. So, you know, maybe this individual is heterozygous for these two different alleles. Well, maybe we only see reads spanning the short one, so we accidentally call this as a homozygous locus. Um, we call that heterozygous dropout. Question? I'm assuming that you're calling them using GATK, or am I assuming that you're going to be using them? Like <coughs> so, right now we're calling using hipster. Okay, so just yeah. calling hipster. Yeah, that's, I mean, and this is, I guess, whatever tool you're using, if it requires you to span the repeat, you're always going to be biased towards things that are shorter because you can span those with, with reads. So the issue is that we get this excess of homozygotes. Um, perfect uh, kind of problem for what we heard earlier, Hardy-Weinberg. Hardy-Weinberg can help us figure out this kind of issue, right? Um, okay, so Hardy-Weinberg is a standard test that people do to test the quality of their SNP genotypes. So we should all know how to do this. Um, here's a bunch of genotypes that we got. Um, this is a, a SNP, because we'll start with something that's easier. Where it's biallelic, you can have either an A or a G. So two easy things we can do is, is write down the observed genotype frequencies, um, and also from that, figure out what's the different frequencies of each of the two different alleles. And I just did this on the way, so I hope my math is right, but it should be approximately that. Okay, so after we calculate those observed allele frequencies, we can figure out what the expected frequency of each diploid genotype should be, um, which is where someone is going to tell me the answer. So how many individuals should I have homozygous for uh, AA? You don't have to give me numbers. You can just tell me in. All right, louder. <laughs> Bogdan. <laughs> I choose you. Oh, you choose you. <laughs> it's, uh, well, it will be better if there will be 0.4. If what? You don't have to give me a number. Oh, just okay. like. So it's that, the P squared, essentially. Okay. Times, and we're doing num uh, times the number of people. So, yeah, of yeah. People. got it. Okay, perfect. Okay, what about homozygous for GG? Q squared. Good. Okay, and what about heterozygous? Good. Okay. And that like looks pretty close, right, to what our observed genotype frequency is, so things are looking good. Um, we can do a chi-square test to make sure that this, this matches you know, what we would have expected based on the allele frequencies. Um, someone shout out the formula for chi-square test. <laughs> observed minus expected squared over expected. Okay, so we get this value. Um, this should follow chi-square distribution with, in this case, one degree of freedom, just number of genotypes minus number of alleles. Um, P equals 0 0.66. Check mark, this follows expected um, genotype frequencies under Hardy-Weinberg. Okay, so what about our heterozygous dropout problem? Um, well, now instead of A's and G's, I'm going to deal with short and long alleles. Um, so um, this might be our underlying true genotypes. But now we have this heterozygous dropout problem where we're biased towards calling the heterozygotes as actually homozygous for the short allele. So maybe this problem is like really severe and, and we, we accidentally miscall a lot of these. Okay, so again, we can write down our observed um, genotypes. And is this, like, are you actually likely to get long, long, uh, homozygous yeah. long? Okay. If it, in terms of can you, are you like in the population? Yes. Can we call it? Yes. So when you do the experiment, are yeah. you more likely to drop out the heterozygous short long than mm -hmm. homozygous long long? If you're homozygous long long, we would either call you that or we would just have missing data because we wouldn't have any reads spanning it at all. Right. So are you more likely to lose a long long or a short long? We're more likely to lose long long. For short long, we're more likely to just call it as homozygous short short. Is it normally just simple or would you have a, a gradation between short and long? So your yep. just didn't next slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's predicting all my next slides. Okay. Uh, 
OK, so we can calculate our expected unit type frequencies again. And like, oh, no, we have a problem because we expected 10 heterozygotes, and we only see two. That's not looking good. Um, so we can do the same chi-squared exercise, and um, now we see that we're significantly departed from what we would have expected <coughs> in the Hardy-Weinberg. Um, as has been, OK, I'm going to skip this question in the interest of time. As has been pointed out, it's, it's actually usually more complicated than that for STR locus. So usually we have um, a big range of different alleles. So these are not usually biallelic, like you would think of SNPs. Um, so here, I think we have an you know, example of nine different alleles, no longer your biallelic thing. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip making you do this question. Um, but <laughs> if you have n alleles, how many possible genotypes? And again, I, I just calculated this on the way, so I hope it's correct. But it's something like n squared, um, number of possible genotypes um, given n different alleles. So in this case, we have nine alleles. And rather than three possible genotypes, we have 45 different possible genotypes. We can still write down the expected frequencies of each of those genotypes. Uh, but now we're getting into really, really low counts, even for alleles that weren't super uncommon. Um, and so this makes it pretty hard to do standard chi-square tests because um, unless we have a really huge sample size, the individual counts for the expected genotypes um, are really, really small. So instead what we do is something a little bit simpler than that. We just test if we have the expected number of heterozygotes versus homozygotes um, by lumping all the genotypes together rather, rather than doing the full-on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So we can calculate the expected number of <coughs> homozygous genotypes by just summing across the squared frequencies of all the alleles. Um, so you know, now, rather than asking how many people do I expect to be homozygous for 5,5, I'm summing together 5,5, 6,6, 7,7, etc. Um, so in this case, I would expect about 18% of the individuals to be homozygous. And now I can just treat that as a binomial variable and ask, um, is the percent of homozygous genotypes in my sample um, close to the percent of homozygous I would have expected by chance based on these allele frequencies that I know. And I can just do that in R if I want. Okay, so we spend a lot of time trying to figure out the best quality controls to do for STR genotypes. Um, and here's just a list of some of the things that we've um, come up with for doing that. Um, I did want to mention how we see if these are actually working. So one thing we can look at in the Simons data set is Mendelian inheritance. So if genotypes are mostly correct, um, most of them should make sense in terms of the genotypes of the child um, can be explained by getting you know, one allele from mom, one allele from dad. Um, here we just broke this up. On the x-axis is the quality score from hipster. On the y-axis is the average Mendelian inheritance rate. And the dashed lines give um, before we applied any of these filters, and the solid lines are after applying those filters. Um, and you can see that the, the quality filters significantly increase our Mendelian inheritance rate across all of the different lengths of the repeat units. Um, OK, so we can use these catalogs to do a lot of cool things. Um, I'm not going to talk about uh, most of the applications today, but I just want to give you a picture of, of what this variation looks like. Um, so of the, um, in this case, 1.3 million loci that we were able to analyze and that pass these filters, about half of these STRs are actually invariant across samples. 20% um, of them are biallelic, like you would get from, from SNPs. And about a third of them are multiallelic. Um, many of them with, uh, with are extremely multiallelic. Some of them have been even you know, 20 different common alleles in the population. Um, we can break that down by things like length of the repeat unit or whatever other feature that you're interested in um, and find that um, for instance, homopolymers tend to be much more polymorphic in the population, whereas if you get up to things with longer repeat units, um, those are the ones that are more likely to be fixed across individuals. Um, okay, so we have large cohorts of STR genotypes. Um, now we'd like to be able to combine that with phenotype information and do some association studies. Question. Uh, I mean, you can always use a prior after the fact. Like, we return the likelihoods, and you can calculate the posterior yourself if you want to, uh, which would probably 
vary based on the population that you look at as well, but you could certainly do that. Um, okay, so let's just briefly talk about um, doing these association tests. So we started by doing this on um, expression data um, because that's what we had available and because there's been um, at least several dozen reported individual cases of STRs in the literature that affect expression of nearby genes. Um, so a lot of these tend to be in promoters of genes, like this example on MMP9. You have a dinucleotide repeat directly upstream of the promoter, and there's this linear relationship um, with expression of the gene. Some of these form binding sites for th different things for promoters. They're not always in promoters. They can often be in introns. So here's an example, ATFR. Um, and they can also be associated with alternative splicing. Um, so there are a var variety of ways in which these STRs have been reported to affect um, expression or splicing phenotypes. Um, but again, we know these several dozen examples or so in the literature, um, we'd really like to be able to characterize this, this genome-wide. Um, so we do things like take all the STRs that are close by a gene, and for the same set of individuals, we can get STR genotypes from Hipster. Um, and if, if we also have expression data for that same set of individuals, um, we can now do the study that we want. Um, so we can now take this data and test for associations between length of the STR and expression of the gene. Um, which, by the way, the test that we're doing right now is assuming this additive relationship between number of repeats and expression. And we're just adding the two repeat alleles together at each genotype and testing that versus expression. Um, but it's becoming pretty clear that more complicated models than that exist. So that's going to be a fun thing to do in the future um, that I didn't have that much time to discuss now. But um, you can definitely do things more complicated than this. Um, but you know, in, in this case, we just did a test um, asking, is the slope of this line different than 0? Um, and I have like three minutes left, so I don't want to run that much over time. I'll just mention we've done this on a couple of data sets, um, most recently in the GTEx data. Um, here's just example QQ plot from the GTEx data looking at what we call these ESTRs, um, and now a bunch of different tissues um, compared to, you know, so we did a study with only a single tissue before. Um, our permuted controls follow what we expect on the null distribution, they're on the diagonal, um, but for basically every tissue profiled, we see a really strong signal of these ESTRs. Um, main computational problem we've had to deal with in, in analyzing these ESTRs is trying to determine, um, are these actually causal variants or are they just tagging nearby SNPs? And I told you already that, that STRs can be imputed from SNPs, so they're in correlation with SNPs nearby. Um, are these actually driving gene expression themselves or are they tagging something nearby? Um, I was gonna go through some of the different tests that we do um, to do that, and I'll just mention um, that this is you know, basically a model comparison problem where we want to ask, does a model that includes our STR explain expression um, better than models that don't include the STR? So one way you might do this is just comparing these two simple models, you know, explaining expression with the best SNP um, versus a model explaining expression using the SNP and the STR. Um, we can do this in R and try and think of different ways to compare these two models. I'll just make you answer one more question. Um, which is, you know, without even looking at the data, which of these models is going to fit better? It depends on how you define better. <laughs> <laughs> For most definitions of better. <laughs> right, so we just add more things. We can, you know, generally explain the, um, the data a little bit better. So, you know, even without looking at the data, we can't just compare, you know, for instance, the, the R squared. Um, of the two different models. We have to take into account the fact that the second model is more complicated. So one thing you might do is, you know, AIC or BIC. We can also use ANOVA to compare these two models. In this particular case, the STR is doing better. Um, I don't have time to tell you about all the different methods that we've tried to be able to get at this problem. Um, but I'll just give you a list of them here. So we've tried a, a couple of different ways to get at this, this problem, including the model comparison or things like linear mixed models from GCTA. Um, no matter what way we do this, we get the same answer, which is about a quarter of these look like they explain expression better than the best SNP. Um, which is, you know, the main point I wanted to make here is that we were really excited initially we had these thousands of associations between STRs and expression. Um, but we really had to take a step back and say, like, okay, like, are these all actually 
real? Should we just go rush and like publish this number? Or what else could be explaining this? So I think it's always important to, to try and think like what other thing besides the thing that I want it to be could be explaining my data. Um, in this case, it's still exciting. Like hundreds of these are still look like the STR is the best thing. Um, but you know, the majority of these actually look like the STR is, is tagging something nearby. And it's important to, to realize that and try and account for that. Yeah, you can overlap them with, with chromatin marks and transcription factor binding sites. We've also tried to use like deep learning approaches to try and, and get at this. Um, Often, if you do things like overlap chromatin marks, then like both the STR and the best SNP will overlap those things, and um, that can still kind of be explained by LD with a different causal variant. Um, so I haven't relied so much on that type of thing. Now with the GTEx data, we have 650 samples, which is a lot more than we had before. So it's a little bit easier there to find map, just statistically, but there's still a lot of them where you can't really tell. They're just in complete LD with SNPs. <coughs> Um, that's a good question, and probably like other EQTL people in the room can. I mean, we know there are more. Right, we know that there are more. Um, the previous slide was not necessarily assuming that. It was just asking, does the STR explain variation better than the top SNP? But it could be tagging a second. Right, so that's why we tried this linear mixed model approaches, where that takes into account all the common SNPs nearby. Problem is that those are really hard to apply when you have small sample sizes, so you get. Per locus, you get really huge standard errors. You could say, like, on average across all the loci, it looks like we're, you know, doing better than the best SNP. But you can't, I can't point to a specific one and say, you know, we're doing way better. Because the standard errors are just too big when you only have a couple hundred samples for those. Um, I'll just quickly point out um, some example um, ones that, that come out as, quote, unquote, causal, where the STR is the um, best explainer of expression. So this is one of our, our favorite ones that always comes up. Um, we actually thought this was a hexmer repeat in the promoter of this gene. Um, but when we look more closely, it's a 12mer repeat um, that clearly explains expression better than any <coughs> SNP nearby that we compare it to. And we actually Google this one. We find that this is actually a known um, pathogenic locus. So that repeat is already known to have some function in the promoter of this gene. Um, the ones where they look like this aren't quite as exciting to me as the ones that look like this, where there are many, many different alleles. And you see a clear, clear allelic series when you, you know, look at the length of the STR versus expression. Um, it's hard to, to explain these highly multi-allelic ones as you know, being due to, to just tagging SNPs. So you know, many of them look exciting like this. But, but again, a lot of these turn out to be um, you know, just, just tagging nearby SNPs. And I, I think that's also an issue generally with, with EQTL studies or GWAS studies in general that I'm sure has been discussed here is, you know, just because you have an association doesn't mean that's your causal thing. Um, okay, so I just wanted to, you know, to wrap up and say, now we have all these tools for analyzing these repeats. Um, a lot of interesting problems come up when we try to deal with repeats that don't always behave like their biallelic SNP friends. Um, and now we're working really hard to apply these tools to um, a lot of big data sets and see what we can discover when we look at this layer of variation that um, often gets filtered from most of the large studies that we think about. And if we have time, I can take more questions or I can let Alexis go.